Hi everyone, before we start tonight's show, I just wanted to say that this is a tester to try a stripped back way of storytelling on the channel because I think it means that I can get a lot more narrations out to all of you. So please do let me know your, what you think, what your feedback is. I would love to know, good or bad. And also, this story has been edited for audio adaption because it contains some highly offensive language. I've had to leave some of it in because it's central to the story. I don't like editing stories in this way often, but occasionally I do have to do it so that all of our listeners can enjoy the tale. And I hope you do. All right, that's all for now. Please do let me know what you think. And on with the show. Ah, I'm glad you could join me this evening. I have to say that, as the sun set, I began to worry that you had been frightened away. No, not unnerved by the stories about my great library, these countless shelves harbouring innumerable sinister pages. I know what the locals say. <laughs> they think me mad to spend my time here. But this library hidden away inside the woods of the estate. It has passed through my family from generation to generation. How long? Who knows? Two hundred years? Two thousand? In one form or another. We have long been the procurers of strange tales. We protect them, as they nourish our minds, channeling them into dark, unfathomable places. For there are twisted revelations to be found among these stories, realisations that can both elevate and corrupt the mind. If you are willing to open yourself to such things and walk with me through these tales, you may just discover something lurking deep within the recesses of your own curious heart. Please, sit. The great fireplace is lit beneath the mantle. These rather luxurious armchairs have been arranged for us. You shall sit here on one side and I on the other as I read a story to you each evening. For these dark dreams must be released to roam outside of their sinister pages. Tonight's story is by Somerset Mohan and it is called The Taipan. Let me find the page. Ah, yes, here we are. The Taipan. No one knew better than he that he was an important person. He was number one and not the least important branch of the most important English firm in China. He had worked his way up through solid ability and he looked back with a faint smile at the callow clerk who had come out to China thirty years before. When he remembered the modest home he had come from, a little red house in a long row of little red houses and barns, a suburb which, aiming desperately at the genteel, achieves only a sordid melancholy, and compared it with the magnificent stone mansion with its wide verandas and spacious rooms, which was at once the office of the company and his own residence, he chuckled with satisfaction. He had come a long way since then. He thought of the high tea to which he sat down when he came home from school. He was at St Paul's, with his father and mother and his two sisters, a slice of cold meat, a great deal of bread and butter, and plenty of milk in his tea, everybody helping himself. And then he thought of the state and which he now ate his evening meal. He always dressed, and whether he was alone or not, he expected the three boys to wait at table, 
His number one boy knew exactly what he liked, and he never had to bother himself with the details of housekeeping. But he always had a set dinner with soup and fish, entree, roast, sweet and savoury, so that if he wanted to ask anyone in at the last moment, he could. He liked his food and he did not see why, when he was alone, he should have less good a dinner than when he had had a guest. He had indeed gone far. That was why he did not care to go home now. He had not been to England for ten years, and he took his leave in Japan or Vancouver, where he was sure of meeting old friends from the China coast. He knew no one at home. His sisters had married in their own station, their husbands were clerks, and their sons were clerks. There was nothing between him and them. They bored him. He satisfied the claims of relationship by sending them, every Christmas, a piece of fine silk, some elaborate embroidery, or a case of tea. He was not a mean man, and as long as his mother lived he had made her an allowance. But when the time came for him to retire, he had no intention of going back to England. He had seen too many men do that, and he knew how often it was a failure. He meant to take a house near the racecourse in Shanghai. What with bridge and his ponies and golf, he expected to get through the rest of his life very comfortably. But he had a good many years before he need think of retiring. In another five or six, Higgins would be going home and then he would take charge of the head office in Shanghai. Meanwhile, he was very happy where he was. He could save money, which you couldn't do in Shanghai, and have a good time into the bargain. This place had another advantage over Shanghai. He was the most prominent man in the community, and what he said went. Even the consul took care to keep on the right side of him. Once a consul and he had been at loggerheads, and it was not he who had gone to the wall. The taipan thrust out his jaw pugnaciously as he thought of the incident. But he smiled, for he felt in an excellent humour. He was walking back to his office from a capital luncheon at the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. They did you very well there. The food was first rate, and there was plenty of liquor. He had started with a couple of cocktails, then he had some excellent sauterne, and he finished up with two glasses of port and some fine old brandy. He felt good. And when he left, he did a thing that was rare with him. He walked. His bearers with his chair kept a few paces behind him, in case he felt inclined to slip into it, but he enjoyed stretching his legs. He did not get enough exercise these days. Now that he was too heavy to ride, it was difficult to get exercise. But if he was too heavy to ride, he could still keep ponies. And as he strolled along to the balmy air, he thought of the spring meeting. He had a couple of griffins that he had hopes of, and one of the lads in his office had turned out a fine jockey. He must see they didn't sneak him away. Old Higgins in Shanghai would give a pot of money to get him over there, and he ought to pull off two or three races. He flattered himself that he had the finest stable in the city. He pouted his broad chest like a pigeon. It was a beautiful day, and good to be alive. He paused as he came to the cemetery. It stood there, neat and orderly, as an evident sign of the community's opulence. He never passed the cemetery without a little glow of pride. He was pleased to be an Englishman, for the cemetery stood in a place valueless when it was chosen, which with the increase of the city's affluence was now worth a great deal of money. It had been suggested that the graves should be moved to another spot and the land sold for building, but the feeling of the community was against it. It gave the Taipan a sense of satisfaction to think that their dead rested on the most valuable site on the island. It showed that there were things they cared for more than money. Money be blowed when it came to the things that mattered. This was a favourite phrase with the Taipan. Well, one remembered that money wasn't everything.
and now he thought he would take a stroll through. He looked at the graves. They were neatly kept, and the pathways were free from weeds. There was a look of prosperity, and as he sauntered along, he read the names on the tombstones. Here were three side by side, the captain, the first mate, and the second maid of the bark, Mary Baxter, who had all perished together in the typhoon of 1908. He remembered it well. There was a little group of two missionaries, their wives and children, who had been massacred during the Boxer Troubles. Shocking thing that had been. Not that he took much stock in missionaries, but hang it all, one couldn't have these damned Chinese people massacring them. Then he came to a cross with a name on it he knew. Good chap, Edward Mullock, but he couldn't stand his liquor. Drank himself to death, poor devil. At twenty-five, the Taipan had known a lot of them do that. There were several more neat crosses with a man's name on them, and the age twenty-five, twenty-six, or twenty-seven. It was always the same story. They had come out to China. They had never seen so much money before. They were good fellows, and they wanted to drink with the rest. They couldn't stand it. And there they were in the cemetery. You had to have a strong head and a fine constitution to drink, drink for drink on the China coast. Of course, it was very sad, but the Taipan could hardly help a smile when he thought how many of those young fellows he had drunk underground. And there was a death that had been useful. A fellow in his own firm, senior to him and a clever chap too. If that fellow had lived, he might not have been Taipan now. Truly the ways of fate were inscrutable. And here was little Mrs. Turner, Violet Turner. She had been a pretty little thing. He had had quite an affair with her. He had been devilish, cut up when she died. He looked at her age in the tombstone. She'd be no chicken if she were alive now. And as he thought of all those dead people... A sense of satisfaction spread through him. He had beaten them all. They were dead and he was alive, and by George, he'd scored them off. His eyes collected in one picture all those crowded graves, and he smiled scornfully. He very nearly rubbed his hands. No one ever thought I was a fool, he muttered. He had a feeling of good-natured contempt for the gibbering dead. And then, as he strolled along, he came suddenly upon two coolies digging a grave. He was astonished, for he had not heard that anyone in the community was dead. Who the devil's that for? he said aloud. The coolies did not even look at him. They went on with their work, standing in the grave, deep down, and they shoveled up heavy clods of earth. Though he had been so long in China, he knew no Chinese. In his day it was not thought necessary to learn the language, and he asked the coolies in English whose grave they were digging. They did not understand. They answered him in Chinese, and he cursed them for ignorant fools. He knew that Mrs. Broom's child was ailing, and it might have died, but he would certainly have heard of it, and, besides, that wasn't a child's grave. It was a man's and a big man's too. It was uncanny. He wished he hadn't gone into that cemetery. He hurried out and stepped into his chair. His good humour had all gone, and there was an uneasy frown on his face. The moment he got back to his office, he called to his number two. I, I say, Peters, who's dead? Do you know? But Peters knew nothing. The Taipan was puzzled. He called one of the native clerks and sent him to the cemetery to ask the coolies. He began to sign his letters. The clerk came back and said the coolies had gone and there was no one to ask. The taipan began to feel vaguely annoyed. He did not like things to happen, of which he knew nothing. His own boy would know. His boy always knew everything, and he sent for him. But the boy had heard of no death in the community. I knew no one was dead, said the Taipan irritably. But what's the grave for? 
he told the boy to go to the overseer of the cemetery and find out what the devil he had dug a grave for when no one was dead. Let me have a whisky and soda before you go, he added, as the boy was leaving the room. He did not know why the sight of the grave had made him uncomfortable, but he tried to put it out of his mind. He felt better when he had drunk the whisky, and he finished his work. He went upstairs and turned over the pages of Punch. In a few minutes he would go to the club and play a rubber or two of bridge before dinner, but it would ease his mind to hear what his boy had to say, and he waited for his return. In a little while, the boy came back and he brought the overseer with him. "'What are you having a grave dug for?' he asked the overseer point-blank. "'Nobody's dead!' "'I didn't dig a grave,' said the man. "'What the devil do you mean by that? There were two coolies digging a grave this afternoon!' The boy and the overseer looked at one another. Then the boy said they had been to the cemetery together. There was no new grave there. The Taipan only just stopped himself from speaking. But damn it all, I saw it myself, were the words on the tip of his tongue. But he did not say them. He grew red as he choked them down. The overseer and the boy looked at him. For a moment, his breath failed him. All right, get out, he gasped. But as soon as they were gone, he shouted for the boy again, and when he came, maddening and passive, he told him to bring some whisky. He rubbed his sweating face with a handkerchief. His hand trembled when he lifted the glass to his lips. They could say what they liked, but he had seen the grave. Why, he could still hear the dull thud as the gravediggers threw the spadefuls of earth on the ground above them. What did it mean? He could feel his heart beating. He felt strangely ill at ease, but he pulled himself together. It was all nonsense. If there was no grave there, it must have been an hallucination. The best thing he could do was to go to the club, and if he ran across the doctor, he would ask him to give him a look over. Everyone in the club looked just the same as ever. He did not know why he should have expected them to look different. It was a comfort. These men, living for many years with one another lives that were methodically regulated, had acquired a number of little idiosyncrasies. One of them hummed incessantly while he played bridge, another insisted on drinking beer through a straw, and these tricks, which had so often irritated the Taipan, now gave him a sense of security. He needed it, for he could not get out of his head that strange sight he had seen, he played bridge very badly, his partner was censorious, and the Taipan lost his temper. He thought the men were looking at him oddly. He wondered what they saw in him that was unaccustomed. Suddenly, he felt he could not bear to stay in the club any longer. As he went out, he saw the doctor reading the times in the reading room, but he could not bring himself to speak to him. He wanted to see for himself whether that grave was really there, and stepping into his chair, he told his bearers to take him to the cemetery. You couldn't have an hallucination twice, could you? And besides, he would take the overseer in with him, and if the grave was not there, he wouldn't see it, and if it was, he'd give the overseer the soundest thrashing he'd ever had. But the overseer was nowhere to be found. He had gone out and taken the keys with him, when the Taipan found he could not get into the cemetery, he felt suddenly exhausted. He got back into his chair and told his bearers to take him home. He would lie down for half an hour before dinner. He was tired out. That was it. He had heard that people had hallucinations when they were tired. When his boy came in to put out his clothes for dinner, it was only by an effort of will that he got up. He had a strong inclination not to dress that evening, but he resisted it. He made it a rule to dress. He had dressed every evening for twenty years, and it would never do to break his rule. But he ordered a bottle of champagne with his dinner, and that made him feel more comfortable. Afterwards, he told the boy to bring him the best brandy. When he had drunk a couple of glasses of this, he felt himself again. Hallucinations be damned. 
He went to the billiard room and practised a few difficult shots. There could not be much the matter with him when his eye was so sure. When he went to bed, he sank immediately into a sound sleep. But suddenly he awoke. He had dreamed of that open grave and the grave diggers digging leisurely. He was sure he had seen them. It was absurd to say it was an hallucination when he had seen them with his own eyes. Then he heard the rattle of the night watchman going his rounds. It broke upon the stillness of the night so harshly that it made him jump out of his skin. And then terror seized him. He felt a horror of the winding, multitudinous streets of the Chinese city, and there was something ghastly and terrible in the convoluted roofs of the temples with their devils grimacing and tortured. He loathed the smells that assaulted his nostrils, and the people, those myriads of blue-clad workers and the beggars in their filthy rags and the merchants and the magistrates sleek, smiling and inscrutable in their long black gowns. They seemed to press upon him with menace. He hated the country, China. Why had he ever come? He was panic-stricken now. He must get out. He would not stay another year, another month. What did he care about Shanghai? Oh my God, he cried, if I were only safely back in England. He wanted to go home. If he had to die, he wanted to die in England. He could not bear to be buried among all those Chinese people with their grinning faces. He wanted to be buried at home, not in that grave he had seen that day. He could never rest there, never. What did it matter what people thought? Let them think what they liked. The only thing that mattered was to get away while he had the chance. He got out of bed and wrote to the head of the firm and said he had discovered he was dangerously ill. He must be replaced. He could not stay longer than was absolutely necessary. He must go home at once. They found the letter in the morning, clenched in the Taipan's hand. He had slipped down between the desk and the chair. He was stone dead. The book closes here, and so too does tonight's exploration of the unknown. I will call upon you again, soon, at which time you will once more walk between the trees of my family estate until you see the flickering candlelight emanating from within my great library. Until then, tread carefully and keep your resolve so that we may once again delve into these stories of the strange and the macabre, releasing them from their slumber within these sinister pages. Sinister Pages and All Ghastly Tales shows are made possible by our amazing Patreon subscribers. Head over to patreon.com forward slash Michael Whitehouse, you'll also find a link in the show notes below, and you will gain access to exclusive podcast episodes you won't hear anywhere else, and a bunch of other goodies for you to enjoy. Thanks again to all those who have supported our horror content so far, we really appreciate it. And with your support, we'll be able to produce much, much more into the dark future.